So I guess you may be sitting there wondering about the title of this talk, perhaps thinking to yourselves, is he seriously going to talk to, about, talk to us about loving legacy code? Surely there's a mistake. <laughs> it used to be a mistake. Just, just hold your fire. Okay. Yeah, um, you may be thinking, how on earth did this talk get selected? But it did, so <laughs> let me ask you this question. Let's have a show of hands. How many of you love legacy code? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to assume that, uh, well, we are in Australia after all, so you, all of you who raised your hands did so ironically. <laughs> but that's okay, because if I'm honest with myself, I don't really love legacy code either. However, I do think it deserves more respect. After all, it's probably paying for your wages right now. And I think it does deserve more love. But let me be clear, I'm not here to convince you that you should unreservedly love legacy code all the time. Rather, I'd simply like to share with you some ideas that may help you love legacy code more. So, to begin with, how should we approach this topic? Starting with, uh, well, what's legacy code after all? How do we define it? Is it just old crufty stuff? Or is it, as Michael Feathers about 10 years ago suggested, code without tests? Now, if I think about that, I think, yeah, that, that would make a code base qualify as legacy because it impedes change. But I think there are other ways that a code base can impede change. For example, if it's got poor internal design or a cumbersome test suite. So I prefer to define legacy code as code that impedes change in any way. Another question to ponder is, why do we react so negatively at the prospect of working with, le with legacy code? Could it be the accumulation of technical debt over a long period of time? Definitely. Because uh, as cumulative uh, band-aid solutions are applied, uh, it leads to poor internal design. Classes and methods can become too large, complex and unwieldy. It can become very challenging to decipher what the code actually does. Readability is so important, isn't it? Or our test suites can be more um, frustrating than helpful. Test suites may take hours to run. We may have uh, some tests that pass sometimes and at other times fail for, for no apparent reason. And then again, of course, as developers, we'll typically not, when working with legacy code, have the opportunity to add the latest bit of shiny technology to our CV. But I'm going to suggest to you that there's another path to developer happiness. Sure, exploring new technology is fun, but imagine a poor, neglected code base that's been left to rot, and you have the opportunity to nurse it back to good health by giving it some much needed tender loving care. Sure, it can be frustrating, it can be character building. Indeed, in some cases, that code base has, uh, may be beyond help. It may have become so decrepit and pungent that the kindest thing to do is to put it out of its misery. But many legacy code bases are nowhere near that bad. We'll talk about how we can nurse them back to health shortly, but let's pause before we do that and consider the original developers. Are they still around? If so, it may pay you to ask them some questions about the history of the code base. Uh, you might be surprised what you learn. Even if you don't have that opportunity, it's important to uh, respect those original developers. Understand why uh, they, they may have made the choices they did and um, <coughs> learn from the history of the code base. But let's move on and consider how we can improve the legacy code that we're dealing with. A logical place to start is with identifying some pain points. Now you might think, well let's start with the code. I'd suggest that 
rather than doing that, we make use of uh, some customer feedback, whether it's in the form of requests for new features or reports of problems, and we can use that opportunity to improve the code at the same time. Then again, customers won't always tell us about uh, problems that affect them, will they? So in this case, tools like uh, New Relic or Rollbar will help us identify problems that affect them, and again, at the same time, we can Im improve the, the quality of the internal code uh, as, as we attend to those problems. And I'm sure we're all familiar with the scenario where a developer is um, frustratedly cursing out loud uh, as they try to understand what some, a particular piece of code does. Well, that's an ideal opportunity for that particular developer to improve the code so that a developer in the future has a better time trying to make sense of the code. As well, we've got to be mindful that uh, practically sometimes developers are under pressure to get fixes out into production. They're not necessarily going to, to, to pause and, um, and put in place those uh, measures to, to improve the code. But we do have code quality tools that can help identify areas of the code that need some tender loving care. So consider that we've identified some pain points. Uh, how do we go about improving the code? What techniques can we use? Well, sadly, we can't always assume that the code base is under version control. Uh, seriously, I have come across this in, in my time. Even after the advent of Git, um, I've seen a Rails application that I was asked to work on uh, that was not, wasn't under version control. So if that's the case with your code base, get it into a Git repository as soon as you can. Thinking back to Michael Feather's definition of legacy code, again, um, if the code base has no tests, uh, this is a showstopper too, isn't it? because, as we know, to refactor safely, you'll need to have automated tests. As we're introducing those tests, we may think of introducing uh, feature tests, end-to-end -end tests. Uh, is that the best thing to do? I'd say that we should be concentrating more on unit tests. Of course, that then raises the question, well, what is a unit test? There's plenty of, of debate about that, that question. Um, I read an interesting book recently by Jay Fields called Working Effectively with Unit Tests, in which he distinguishes between what he calls solitary unit tests and sociable unit tests. And the solitary ones are those that are truly isolated, so they are going to enable us to get fast feedback. They're the, the, uh, the most useful. So we should be aiming to have as many of those as possible. Um, in order to, to facilitate developer flow, and another example of that is uh, configuring guard to automatically rerun tests that are affected by the code changes we make. As we're introducing unit tests, as Michael Feathers emphasises, we're going to need to break some dependencies in the code. And that will have the, uh, the useful side effect of improving the internal quality of the code, of the, of the design. But uh, having introduced some tests, or maybe you inherited a legacy code base that already has a large suite of tests, we're going to need to nurture those tests. We need to constantly reassess the value of the tests. Um, we shouldn't just keep on accumulating them. We should think of each test in business terms. Uh, is it providing sufficient value for the cost that it uh, requires to keep maintaining that test? And in some cases, we'll need to remove tests. Uh, and it turns out that, uh, in my experience, Feature tests are a good example of, of tests that uh, we should consider removing if they're becoming too troublesome. First, after, after all, they, they take longer to run, they tend to be more unreliable. And it's interesting to note that uh, in Jay Field's book, he recommends that for an application we have no more than a dozen smoke tests. We'll also need to nurture our CI builds. Uh, for example, if we've inherited a test suite that um, takes hours to run, split it up into to several steps and run them in parallel. Or if we encounter tests that uh, fail unexpectedly, they pass locally, we, did, we find that they're failing in a non-deterministic fa non fashion. Take them out of the normal build stream and attend to them, obviously within a reasonable period of time, either fixing them so that they pass all the time or, or getting rid of them. All right, so we can now picture the 
place where we've come to that we, we have some tests in place and we can refactor. As we do so though, we'll have to make judgments about <coughs> which refactorings are going to bring us most benefit. Because there's uh, rarely a budget that will provide uh, the opportunity for us to refactor ad infinitum to our heart's content. We'll also be needing to um, be mindful of separating concerns and aware that, that Rails doesn't always uh, necessarily uh, <coughs> guarantee a separation, a good separation of concerns to us. Um, for example, thinking of Rails models classes. Um, if you think of this example, here's an example of a, uh, a Rails class that's accumulated many methods over time. This is from a, a seven-year-old Rails application. You can guess that it's, a, uh, it's what's known as a, a god class and it's got way too many methods, 104 to be precise. So it's a pretty safe bet that this is a class that uh, should be analysed and <coughs> refactored and a lot of the methods moved out to perhaps service classes. But it's also worth pondering um, what are best practices. I mean, that situation probably came about because of the uh, so-called best practice that several years ago had the recommendation of uh, having skinny controllers and fat models. But it's worth thinking about the reality that what's considered a best practice today may not be considered optimal in several years' time. But when it boils down to it, we're aiming to <coughs> make our code easier to work with, um, easier to maintain. And to do this, we'll probably want to be endeavouring to simplify design. And this could bring us to this following set of uh, design rules that um, were originally codified by Kent Beck, one of my software heroes, and more recently revisited in Corey Haynes' book, Understanding the Four Rules of Simple Design. Also, it's worth noting here that the third rule uh, of strive for no duplication is concerned with knowledge duplication rather than simple code duplication. Corey actually uh, alludes to a couple of blog posts by J.B. Rainsberger, and in one of those, J.B. Rainsberger, he distills those four rules down to this simple guiding statement. And I think that if we strive to remove duplication and improve names in small cycles, and stick at that, that guiding principle, we will end up with much better code and usually less code to maintain. So that's a win. And it's got another side effect. It's often easy to underestimate uh, the satisfaction of transforming bad code into good code. A job's been well done, we've made the code easy to understand, easy to test and generally in a better state for future developers. Other opportunities arise uh, when working with legacy code. You know, there, there, there are good things that uh, you can be involved with. For example, in a team, discuss what your team considers uh, a good internal design guidelines, good code guidelines. Or perhaps engage with members of your organisation uh, outside of the dev team in, in, in business groups to um, maybe examine a subsystem or feature that proving a little troublesome and jointly arrive at a better system design. So these are, uh, I think, really challenging and uh, rewarding opportunities that arise when working with legacy code that don't necessarily, don't necessarily arise when working on Greenfields projects. Of course, tools can be of great benefit to the fallible brains of developers. Uh, at Blake eLearning, where I work, we're making quite good use, I think, of, of code climate as proving useful for us, not just in measuring code quality, uh, but also test coverage. But there are other open, or there are open source tools to consider as well, like Rubocop. Uh, as I mentioned before, as a team you might decide what are your uh, internal, or what are your, your code guidelines, uh, and you can configure Rubocop to give the developers some feedback, help them along that path. And if you look at the, uh, the Ruby Toolbox site uh, in the code metrics category, you'll find more examples of, uh, of helpful 
open source tools, cloud metric tools. Another thing to consider is that uh, it's, it's worth uh, going that extra step and including, for example, Rubocop in a step in your build to provide that feedback every time you do a build on your CI server. Okay, let's switch focus to managers and um, consider that uh, obviously there are limits on how much can be invested, how much can be spent maintaining and improving legacy applications, but we need a balanced approach. Uh, adequate maintenance requires time and effort. Uh, technology does need to be updated and upgraded. Technical, technical debt needs to be recovered. It all takes time. So um, don't plan with a blind spot. Budget for maintenance. And if necessary, be aware that there will be situations where a legacy code base has become too difficult to work with. And it's time to make that decision, make that call to migrate away, perhaps gradually. And hopefully the new code base will have a better history. I'm guessing that uh, many of you in the audience will be familiar with a lot of the suggestions I've been making. But I think there's an even more, in, more important aspect, and that is the attitude which we bring to working with legacy code. Staying with the manager's perspective, as well as acknowledging the time and effort that's required, we need to be mindful that there are tools that uh, are not open source and therefore require an investment. Um, for example, um, and this is a, a true story, your developers may have been struggling and got to the point where they decided, no, Jenkins is just not cutting it anymore as a CI server. And actually we've been evaluating this new, new um, solution and uh, we think it's worth the investment. It's a, it's a tool called BuildKite. That actually happened. And fortunately our manager uh, made the wise decision and authorised the expenditure. But as managers, it's important to show that you respect your, um, your developers because after all, they're trying to improve the business via improving the code. One way of showing that you respect them is by acknowledging that at times it is um, wearing to work on legacy code support. So share that production support role around the team. Enable everyone in the team to get a good appreciation of, of the code base and where the challenges are. Okay, developers, it's, it's your turn. How can your attitude improve, perhaps? Knowledge in the head of one developer is obviously a risky scenario. So I know I've been aware of that situation, uh, not necessarily knowledge being in my head, but it, within a team context many times in my career. If, uh, particularly if you're that person that, that's, that's got a lot of knowledge and isn't perhaps shared well enough around the team, make the effort to spread it, spread that knowledge throughout the team because that's going to help everyone. Uh, and speaking of collaboration, I can recall back in the 1980s uh, I was, well, not, not so much privileged but had the opportunity to use a, an approach called structured walkthroughs to review code. Fast forward to today and thankfully we have GitHub pull requests which offer a fantastic opportunity to collaborate as we're developing features. So it's worth pondering and asking yourself the question, are you making the best use uh, of GitHub pull requests? Are you using them to their best potential? I think so far I've been focusing mainly on the, the past and the present but it's worth considering the question, are you giving uh, sufficient focus to the needs of future developers. For example, um, we mentioned non-deterministic non test values before. So if you uh, commit some changes, unexpectedly to you the build breaks on, uh, on CI and you say, oh, it's nothing to do with the work I've been doing, you run it locally, it passes. You determine it, it's a non-deterministic failure. The temptation, of course, is just to click the button to rebuild and hope that it goes green the next time. That may get you out of the situation in the short term, but perhaps it's not helping other developers in the future. Maybe that 
the uh, same problem will come back and bite you. So, good idea to make the effort to at least start the process of fixing it and making life easier for the developers in the future. Another important aspect, I think, is um, the language that we use as we're working with legacy code bases. I mean, the sentiment, what were they effing thinking when they wrote this, is probably unhelpful. And we should remind ourselves that when they wrote the code that we're now struggling with, they usually, in most cases, wrote it with the best of motives. Life throws up a variety of, uh, of circumstances that affect people when working with code. So it's worth reflecting on the constraints that have existed since the first line of code was written in that application. This should be self-evident, but I think as programmers uh, we like perfection, but uh, we've got to remind ourselves that uh, no code base is perfect. And um, uh, yeah, I continually remind ourselves of that. Yep, we should be uh, appreciating that our managers have a, often a better perspective of the business and how the code supports that. So it's important to use them as allies rather than, uh, than fighting against them. And respect that they're under pressure too. So let's turn finally to some metaphors that uh, may help us with our attitude. We've been talking about nursing an application back to a healthy state. But I'm sure many of us at home uh, may have a garden. I don't know how many would be in absolutely pristine condition though. I know my garden isn't, but I do somehow manage to keep it from becoming horribly overgrown with weeds. And I think if we, talk, we, we think about that um, uh, gardening metaphor, it applies particularly well to software. Or at home again, there may be a view that there's a need for a new kitchen or an alternative view that perhaps we should convert part of a room into a bar. Or maybe there's a reality that the shower is leaking and it needs fixing. There's going to be a need to compromise and the same is true of software. We can't pretend that we're going to fix all the flaws in the code at once. So all in all, attitude is very important. And hopefully I've convinced you that uh, working with legacy code needn't be a prospect that you want to run away from. It can be rewarding provided you approach it with a helpful set of techniques and the right attitude. Considering those that have been involved with the code so far are working with it now and will be affected by it in the future. And respecting those people, if we do that, I'm sure we'll feel better about the code as a result. So thanks for listening. I hope that by sharing some of these ideas, I've shed some light on how you can learn to love legacy code more.